much, Bruce. That was a very, very long introduction. And uh, although I'm flattered, um, I would like to make that time back up. <laughs> if you guys are okay, we don't have to rush, and there's enough time for questions at the end. Um, but uh, we'll better start now. So the webinar altogether, um, I would like to discuss first why are we bothering to measure blood gases? You know, you could say I've done that for ages without and I'm, I'm doing fine. Uh, there are some good reasons uh, to think about uh, doing it a little bit more. I will give you a short introduction into the basic physiology. Um, and normally splits a group, splits, uh, splits a group of people, you know, who love physiology and people who hate it. But at the end of the day, I'll do it short and without physiology. Uh, it's difficult to understand. Um, just a brief um, idea of how analyz um, the analyzers work. I think it's nice to know a little bit about that rather than just putting a cartridge in and see what comes out. Um, we talk about acid base analysis, um, arterial blood gases, including the sampling technique and venous blood gases. So that is the, you know, some people uh, put that together sometimes. What is actually blood gas analysis? and Technically, blood gases are, you know, arterial blood gases we measure for oxygenation, but a lot of machines now give you acid-base analysis, and you can actually use venous samples for blood gas analysis as well. I'll explain that to you later. So, why should we do it? Now, it gives vital information, and if you see the list about oxygenation, ventilation, and acid-base balance, and all of these words are really, really, really crucial within the body. We know that we need oxygen, otherwise it's game over. Without ventilation, um, there will be no transfer of oxygen into the blood and CO2 out. And the acid-base balance, if you're not working within the physiological range, um, you're, you're getting into deep trouble. So that alone would be just one slide to explain it and we could close there. But uh, there's also limitations of physical examination and other tests to get these values by any other means. So our blood gas analysis makes definitely sense, especially for my job where I come from, in the critical patient. We need to know um, more about these guys because they have less capacity for errors. They're on thin ice, right? And if we try to guesstimate and so on, we might get them into more trouble they are already in. And they might not be able to afford that. For example, there's no other way uh, to estimate or measure, or to, to estimate CO2 levels without measuring anything. It is, although we think when you see a dog breathing really hard or a dog that is tachypnic, you think, my God, he must blow off a lot of CO2, but he could move a lot of dead space and there could be other disturbances that um, actually make it impossible for him to get rid of CO2. So there's no way to find out in any other way. Also, a critical patient needs frequent, frequent and repeated assessment because otherwise you can't really assess a trend and, and emergency in critical case, not just about monitoring um, numbers and writing them down on a piece of paper. It's about repeated examinations to be on top of things um, and see a trend. And we recognize them early so we can intervene early if we haven't um, already anticipated anything. So basic physiology, just basic, bear with me. It's very straightforward. It's not complicated, the whole physiology and the acid base and blood gas analysis system, but it's a little bit complex and um, it's sometimes difficult to understand um, um, if you just read a book about it. But if you work with more and more cases now in the future, hopefully, um, then uh, you will see the benefits of it. So we know that the normal cell metabolism produces a vast amount of byproducts within the metabolism. It's absolutely normal. But these byproducts can potentially be harmful and change the normal pH because, you know, one big byproduct is H plus um, uh, ions and they can disturb normal body function tremendously if they would just be let loose without control and not being buffered. The buffer systems, and they are very, very different ones, so I'll talk about the two main ones quite a bit. They counteract the changes, but they aim to keep the pH in blood within physiological range, but they don't really um, influence it uh, in a way that it is going the other way. The buffer systems are more or less just cushioning um, um, an impact uh, that H plus ions, for example, would otherwise have. Without buffer systems, there would be much more 
uh, marked the response to uh, H plus concentration changes. Now the great news, and this is, um, you couldn't invent it better, evolution is a wonderful thing. Why um, uh, would it be difficult without an open buffer system? Because if you just would have, like in a petri dish, you would pipet it in, then nobody could go anywhere and you would need to deal with what you're having. There are two main systems and because we have the lungs involved dealing with CO2 and um, uh, water and the kidneys involved dealing with H plus and bicarbonate, we have an open buffer system so if you look at that formula, and I won't give you many formulas, um, uh, chemical formulas, but that one is worth noting that you know, CO2 and uh, water, um, uh, carbonic um, acid, uh, which is very unstable, it will go quite quickly, but if you have, for example, an increase in H plus on the right side, it will push the reaction to the left, and the accumulation of CO2 is easily um, blown off, so to speak, by the lungs and can leave the system, and therefore we call it open buffer system. Hey, it's great because it's unlimited, so to speak, in its regulatory capacity. There are much more, well, sorry, many more buffer systems, especially from the metabolic component, but to learn the beginning stages of it, I think we just focus on the kidneys. They handle bicarbonate and uh, so HC, HCO3 minus and H plus, that's the metabolic component and we'll use that nomenclature a little bit more later on. And the lungs handle the CO2, so to speak, and um, would be described as the respiratory component. So what happens during a disturbance? If there's a disturbance in one component, the other component tries to compensate that and that's a great thing. If one component has changed primarily and for example decreased the pH, the other component will try to change in order to stabilize pH in the other way. For example, if it has been decreased by the one component, it will be increased by the other one and the other way around. So at the end of the day, for example, you have an increase in bicarbonate, the metabolic part of the component of the acid base a regulatory disturbance, um, you would expect an increase in CO2. And if you have a decrease in bicarbonate, you would expect a decrease in CO2 and vice versa. I explain it, well, I lied, I gave you another formula, sorry about that, but this one is also important, but very quickly, it will just explain to you the following thing. So if you see that pH is actually calculated, by, has to do with pK and, and certain um, acids, when it's saturated and when it has, an, anyway, you see the relationship between HCO3 bicarbonate on top um, or within the brackets and a factor and then PCO2 are below the divider in the bracket. So it's a ratio. So the ratio between bicarbonate and PCO2, the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood, is actually what determines the pH. So there you have a pH, let's say the normal number is 7.4. You would have a 1.3 value that is added to this one, and that would mean you have roughly a little bit more HCO3 minus, then you would have PCO2. If now bicarbonate would increase, you see mathematically that value would get bigger, and if you wouldn't then be able to change HCO3 much, the only way to get that compensated would be to increase the PCO2 as well. So if the upper part would go up to 2, and the lower part would go up to 2, then it would be 1 again. Right? Mathematically. Very easy, but it explains the relationship between bicarbonate and CO2. So they're related to each other and that makes it easy for us later on to analyze blood gases because of that relationship. There are different blood gas analyzers and I know a lot of you might be interested in um, either buying a machine or you've recently bought a machine and you think you don't get the best out of it yet. There are tremendous value for money regarding, and I'm, I have no interest in any, I don't have any stocks in any companies, but in the old days it was difficult to buy because they were expensive. Then you had only benchtop analyzers and now there are more and more bedside analyzers like handheld ones like you see here, which actually um, are a 